Welcome to this week's episode of the Liberty Unveiled Podcast, formerly the Teshua Unveiled Podcast. I am your host, Brad Hopp, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Pastor Sam Jones. Together, we are unveiling liberty one episode at a time. We'll be discussing the latest in trafficking news, insider stories from those being delivered, and studying the Founder's Bible to learn how to return America to sanity and true freedom. Our sponsor for today's show is Teshua Tea Company. Visit TeshuaTea.com or DeliveranceTea.com. I do misspeak in this week's episode and call it Deliverance Unveiled. It's actually DeliveranceTea.com. So make sure you stop by DeliveranceTea.com to check out the products. Thank you. Actually, we're going through a little bit of a name change, so I got to used to that. It's actually the new Liberty Unveiled podcast, and we're I'm going through the name change just because a lot of people don't understand the name Teshua. It's a Hebrew word for deliverance, and, and so... Um, so we re- decided to rename the podcast Liberty Unveiled. So welcome to the new show. Um, well, for the, same old show, new name. Yeah, same old show, show new name. But uh, for the website, we're actually going to a, a dual URL. So you can either go to Teshua Unveiled for the actual store for the all the products that the girls are making. Or you can go to Deliverance Unveiled. If it's easier for you to spell, you can go to Deliverance Unveiled. Um, so we're going to be going through some of the products that the girls are making. For those of you that may be catching up or don't know a lot about us, uh, my partner, Andrew, is a missionary in, in Communist Asia, my business partner, uh, and he and the team rescue underage girls out of sex trafficking. We get the girls into our rescue and rehab facility where we meet all of their needs. We give them an education, teach them to read and write, and do all that stuff. But then we're teaching them how to make bracelets and coasters and harvest and process tea and coffee and different things like that. And then we buy the products from the girls up front so that they have economic empowerment. And then that gives them money when they leave our, our rescue facility that they have saved up and they're able to stand on their own and do all that kind of stuff. So um, so I encourage you to stop by Deliverance Unveiled and check out the products the girls are making. Uh, as we've talked about in previous episodes, these are world-class teas and coffees that they're harvesting and, and bringing in for us. Um, so anyway, so... Uh, interesting side note going along with that uh, we just got in the new shipment of the 2019 crop of the um, uh, Thai coffee and um, uh, okay so so now to somebody who drinks Folgers <laughs> somebody who uh, who maybe not might not be quite as uh, you know up on the coffee terminology mm-hmm. what is the difference between a Thai coffee and a not Thai coffee. Okay, so one of the biggest things with the Thai coffee is that it's not going to be bitter. Okay. Um, like you could literally. Okay, so for example, I've made a lot of coffee over my lifetime, and you can take and um, uh, make a standard coffee. Uh, you know, a, a Mexican or whatever, maybe a, a Nigerian, um, a Kenyan, whatever, and you'll notice that they'll, after several hours sitting in the pot on the on the coffee maker, they'll kind of get a little bit more bitter as mm-hmm. they sit there. You can leave the Thai coffee sit in the coffee pot for four or five, six hours, and it won't turn bitter. It's a very mm. smooth, very creamy um, coffee that doesn't have the bitter notes that a lot of other coffees do. Uh, and so um, this coffee in the Thai language, and I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce the it in the Thai language, but it means... Um, Rattan stream because the area of, of Thailand that it comes from um, is uh, um, known for rattan growing. They grow the rattan reeds that okay. that they use for for making rattan furniture and stuff. So, um, so a Thai coffee is a sanctified coffee that puts away all bitterness. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I really like that. That's funny. So anyway, so we'll we'll jump into it, but. Um, just as an upfront, I would encourage you to stop by the Deliverance Unveiled and check out some of the products that the girls are making. Uh, we're going to talk about the Wild Tree Black uh, Tea that's infused with, uh, or excuse me, Ancient Tree Black uh, Tea infused with natural wild or natural fragrant rice flavors. <laughs> if I can talk today, so Ancient Tree Black infused with natural uh, fragrant rice flavors. So. Um, this is a really interesting tea, um, but we'll let this steep here a little bit. And uh, it is a black tea. Um, it, you know, one thing I always think about when it comes to 
tea like this, you know, in the uh, loose leaf tea, the only tea you really should buy, um, mm -hmm. is a lot of times people are a little bit intimidated because they don't know, they don't have the equipment to make it. Because, you know, a tea bag, you go and you get it, warm water up, a lot of times in a microwave mm -hmm. or something like that, put it in and dunk it a three, three four times, pull it out, you know, right. or whatever. Um, on the website, mm -hmm. they can get everything they need there, right? Right. We have the little, uh, this is a little pitcher that that uh, we sell right on the site. Uh, it has a, uh, a brewing contraption on the inside that will hold the tea, it'll hold the water, or it'll hold the tea leaves, hold the water, and then in the bottom of it has a strainer. And so you, there's a little button right on top and you just push that and it allows the, the water to drain, or the tea, the finished tea, to drain down into the bottom of the pitcher. Um, so we have that, we have the little cups. We use the little cups just for sampling and, and whatnot here. And so you can really see the color of the tea. Um, that way we don't take a potty break three times throughout the yeah, podcast. So. Yeah, uh, especially the way I drink water. But um, but anyway, so we have that. We have some actual uh, Yixing clay teapots. Um, Yixing clay is a, uh, is a very particular type of tea, It's or uh, excuse me, particular type of uh, clay that comes from a certain very specific region of Asia. Um, and it is known for... Uh, as you season it over the time, mm. it will develop the flavor and, and, and actually enhance the flavor of the tea. And, and a lot of times people that are really serious about drinking tea will have uh, that yeasting clay teapot for one particular tea. And they'll let it just season over the year after year after year and, and it'll really enhance the flavor of the tea and um, just they're they're kind of revered. True Yixing clay teapots are really really highly revered. Um, so we have those some of those available. Um, we have a lot of different stuff. We have the clay figurines from the girls and and so on and so forth. So um, so I've let this sit for about a minute. Um, hopefully my water was still hot enough. We've sat here talking for. Oh wow! What? Uh, this is a black tea, is that right? Yes, it's a black tea, so. and it's uh. So I'm guessing first deep is gonna be just a little bit light. Mm-hmm. But uh, it feels hot though. Yeah. So it's yeah. still good. Oh yeah, it'll be it'll be good. We normally do about two or three steeps. I feel like during mm -hmm. the show. So yeah, we do. Uh, it'll get progressively a little bit darker each time and mm -hmm. a little bit uh, richer in flavor. Mm. That's really good though. Oh wow, that's a lot more flavor than I thought it was going to be there. That's really mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoa. It's um, uh, this is an ancient tree, so this is a um, uh, like a five hundred year old, four to five hundred year old, very old tree. Uh, one thing that that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, one thing that you need to understand on tea leaves, especially or trees, uh, tea trees, is simply the fact that the older the tree, the better the flavor of the tea is going to be. It's going to be a lot more. It's gonna be a lot stronger. It's gonna be a lot better tea. It's like cheese, mm -hmm. you know. The uh, the longer, the, the older the cheese is, right. or the more it's aged, the right. stronger the flavor is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and for tea though, it's not just stronger because sometimes you might be going, well, hey, I, I don't want to be chewing on dirt, mm -hmm. and that's not what it is. It's no. the richer the flavor mm -hmm. is what it is, mm -hmm. and it's just, oh, man, this is really good. Yeah. Like, yeah. So it's got the natural fragrant rice flavors in it. It's infused with that and stuff. So it's yeah, I really like this one too. And almost, to me, the older the tea has, it almost gets like a honey note mm -hmm. at the very end mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. And this this has that yeah. on there too, which is incredible for black tea to have that. Because normally black teas are, are generally what you think of as a little bit more bitter. You know, it's your, it's your uh, for if you're a coffee drinker out there, it's your dark roast compared to your mm -hmm. breakfast roast. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, but this is impressive tea right here. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of going back to the Thai coffee where it's, you know, you would expect that more bitter. Um, that's one of the things on the really high grade teas that you notice they're not bitter. And that's the reason that they're high grade. Um, you know, the, the Thai coffee that we're bringing in is an extremely high grade uh, coffee. It's a specialty grade. And, and so it's not cheap, you know. Um, we don't just give it away because, I mean, and, mm -hmm. and we are cheaper. There's, there's three... 
uh, that I know of, there's three sources for this particular coffee that we carry. The um, uh, Rattan Stream. <laughs> I was I was going to attempt to say it in, in the Thai language, but I'm not going to. Um, uh, the Rattan Stream coffee is... Um, um, that's what I was looking for. Um, it's not bitter. There's three sources for it in the United States that I know of. Uh, one of them sells it for eighteen ninety five a, a pound, mm -hmm. and so we're we're right in that ballpark. Um, ours is fifteen for fourteen ounces, but um, I think there's is a pound. There might be fourteen ounces too, but so it's a very high grade tea anyway, or a real high grade coffee. What's that? Yours is cheaper than theirs, also. Yeah. It, you know, here's the thing about uh, that, that I would say about this for, for kind of my endorsement and my thoughts on it is it you're probably going to pay the price anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not going to pay the price, then you're probably going to be drinking something that's not as good. Right. And uh, so if you're going to pay the price anyway, and a lot of times people go and this is how they, they view Christianity, okay? Right. Um, it, they see a Christian product and, you know, uh, you go out there and you listen to a lot of you know Christian music, and you go, well, it should be cheaper because it's not as good as worldly music. Right. You know, the the, the quality is not as good, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it might be. Um, and so people go and they expect a cheaper price from Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the deal: this stuff is not second rate. Mm -mm. This is th this competes and is better than mm -hmm. what you're what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it goes and it helps out a good <clears throat> cause. Mm -hmm. And not just a good cause, not just a humanitarian cause, but a spiritual cause. And we're going to get into that today. Mm -hmm. uh, about how this is really reaching generational faith. Right. Uh, in, in his, and that's the intent of it and, it, and it will continue to do that. But then the other thing is, is that you're going to pay for it anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pay for it anyway, you might as well help out uh, and you know, invest in spiritual investment mm -hmm. with that. And you might as well get a good product. Mm -hmm. So, right. That's, and, that's and, what I would say. You know, and the thing is, is that, and this is one of the reasons that I've set up Teshua the way we have, because I'm of the school of thought that we as Christians are to be reflections of God. Mm -hmm. And if you really stop and look at it, and you really stop and think about who God is, what is his character, how does he act, how does he behave, um, so on and so forth. He's not chintzy. He's not cheap. He doesn't build inferior things. No. He he does everything top notch. He he is a master craftsman. He's a master creator. And he's never when when he got done with creation in the original intent of the garden, everything was in absolute perfection. And we, we, even though we live in a fallen world, we still get glimpses of that perfection. Even in our fallen humanity, we still see glimpses of that, of that perfection. And so when, when you stop and think about it, in my opinion, and I believe this is patterned after the Holy Spirit and after God, is that when, you, when I as a Christian put forth second-rate stuff, that doesn't reflect well on my Creator. Right. Well, it's... We want excellence for the Lord, mm -hmm. not junk for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, un unfortunately throughout the years, a lot of times Christianity has... And, and we're not here to bash Christianity. Right. So, so don't, you know, no, don't, don't like get that. that. Uh, but a lot of times we, we get into the junk for Jesus mode. Mm -hmm. um, and really we want is excellence for the Lord. And this is uh, uh, this is absolute excellence for the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and it's one of those things of I think God has blessed that because the ministry has had incredible success. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the stories that we've been able to hear from Andrew and the stories that we've mm -hmm. been able to uh, just, you know, read and hear and all these kind of things. I mean, uh, people whose lives are radically changed by the mm -hmm. gospel of Jesus Christ. And then they're encouraged mm -hmm. through this and they are, uh, they're not, they have an escape from going back. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just uh, not just safe from the penalty of sin, but it's also being safe from the power of sin. And mm -hmm. this is something that empowers them so they don't have to go back and sell their bodies. They mm -hmm. don't have to go back and do this. They are seeing their worth and their value in other ways in, in Christ, mm -hmm. not in uh, not in whatever their um, owner would have for them. Right. And, and that's the incredible thing. Mm -hmm. And that really goes back to what you and I were talking about beforehand. Um, you know... Uh, 
over the course of the weekend, you were you were uh, able to come over, and you and Sarah were able to come over, and and we had a um, uh, a marriage conference at church this weekend to catch everybody up to speed, and and we had a couple um, very well, we had um, a Christian psychologist. I don't even know. I mean, this guy's got so many titles behind his name. I uh, yeah, well, and I I don't even know if I could repeat them all. Well, well I just I I mean. I was telling Pastor Kerry about this. Uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're out to eat for, for supper, and I, I told him, I said, yeah. And Dr. Majors gets up, and you introduce him as a Christian psychologist. And immediately I go, oh, Christian <laughs> psychologist. Man, oh, these guys no. are, they, these guys go, and they, they take, you know, psychology, and they uh, try to put, you know, a Bible verse in there, and they just ruin the Bible verse. And th- let me be honest, what uh, Dr. Majors is, he's a theologian. Who mm-hmm. has psychological degrees, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. or, or however you you would say that? Uh, but then he's also a medical doctor, I think, too, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't it? I think so. I, I, I he, like you said here, he's got so many accolades that I, I mean, I can't even. A, a neuropharmacist, I think, too. I think it was uh, the other one, like a yeah. neuropharmacist. I mean, he's got so many titles. <laughs> yes, yeah. I just call him Doc. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, <laughs> exactly. But but I mean, uh, when he started going and presenting the Word of God, I'm I'm going, he's. He's presenting a biblical worldview. I've never heard this from Christian psychology. Mm-hmm. Normally, I sit out there and I just go, ah. Yeah. But no, it was just sp- it was, it uh, was spot on. Good. I mean, it was right. just a wonderful conference with mm-hmm. him and Pastor Bill Tweet. How, how do you say his name? It, it's Tweet. It's uh, T V E D T. That's why I, I call him Pastor Bill. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, see, People ought to have simple names. I'm a Sam Jones. <laughs> I'm a believer in that. Mm-hmm. No, I'm Hop. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> but I mean, just a wonderful conference. It was. And, and so I just, I just wanted to say that before we got into it. Yeah. But, I mean, it, wow. Yeah. And Pastor Bill did an absolutely fantastic job. And, and I think it was Pastor Bill that was was talking about um, uh, Jonathan Edwards and Max Jukes. There's a study mm-hmm. that was done several years back where they went through and they looked at the signer of the Declaration of Independence, John, Declaration of Independence, if I can talk, uh, Jonathan Edwards, and they went through his lineage, and they went through the lineage of a guy named Max Jukes, who was just a notorious reprobate, and they looked at the family line of of this of these two family trees, and it was just absolutely amazing to me. I mean, it's just. The the well, well, actually, Jonathan Edwards. I don't think he's a signer of the Declaration, but he was a rev- uh, preacher in the first. Um, yeah. Uh, the Great Awakening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, in just a godly man, and so mm-hmm. basically, here, and do you have the statistics on these things? Yeah, I'm going to find them here. But so I'll let you. I'll, I'll just kind of give a brief overview. Then it's a godly line versus. An mm-hmm. ungodly line, and and we're going to see that here. And it starts with one godly man mm-hmm. and one notorious not godly man, right? Or ungodly man, and it, you know sometimes we sit out there and we think, what kind of an impact are we having? Mm-hmm. And the truth of the matter is, you're having an impact whether you want to or not, right? You're people gonna... are watching you. You're mm-hmm. instilling things in other people. Yep. You, you know, as Christians, we're called to be ambassadors of Christ, but it, actually. We're not called to be. We are called ambassadors for Christ, which is, there's a distinction here. It's not if you feel like it being an ambassador. God says you are an ambassador. The question is not if you will be or if you won't be. The question is will you be a good one or will you be a bad one? Mm-hmm. That's the question. But uh, I'll, I, if you found the, the statistics yeah. on this, this is incredible. So, okay, so Jonathan Edwards, uh, his legacy includes one U.S. vice president, one dean of a law school, one dean of a medical school, three U- three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, thirteen college presidents, thirty U.S. judges, uh, sixty doctors, sixty-five professors, seventy-five military officers, eighty public office holders, one hundred lawyers, one hundred clergymen, and two hundred and eighty-five college graduates. Uh, they so. Um, uh, this was almost 150 years after his birth. So in 150 years, that's his his family lineage. He was a godly man, but he was also hardworking, intelligent, and moral. Uh, furthermore, Winship uh, states much of the capacity and talent, talent and intensity character of the more than 1,400 of the Edwards family is due to Mrs. Edwards. Um, 
so mom had a major impact in the family too. Mm-hmm. She taught and trained and, and, and educated her children in the ways of the Lord uh, alongside of her husband and, and it, it became a blessing to the, to the generations. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on Jonathan Edwards, so he was a Puritan preacher in the 1700s. He was one of the most respected preachers in his day. He attended Yale at the age of 13 and later went on to become president of Princeton College. He married his wife, Sarah, in 1727, and they were blessed with 11 children. Every night, Mr. Edwards was home, or when Mr. Edwards was home, he would spend an hour conversing with his family and then praying a blessing over each child. That's the father imparting a blessing over each of the children who will pass that blessing on to the generations. And that's extremely important. And, and right now you're seeing a lot of, you're seeing in America, you're seeing a lot of the fruit of not doing that. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll get to that here in a second. Um, so he and his wife, Sarah, uh, passed the godly legacy on to their 11 children. Um, okay, so Max Juke's legacy came to people's attention when the family trees of 42 different men in the New York prison system were traced back to him. 42. He lived in New York about the same time as Edwards, or about the same period as Edwards. The Jukes family originally was studied by sociologist uh, Richard L. Dugdale in 1877. Jukes' descendants included seven murderers, 60 thieves, 60 thieves, 190 prostitutes, 150 other convicts, 310 paupers, 440 who were physically wrecked to it by addiction to alcohol of the 1200 de- descendants who were studied 300 died permanently when we talk about these things and we talk about the work that Tishua is doing we always talk about it gener- generationally and you're seeing a picture of this fathers your in job is exceptionally important exceptionally important in in my kids and i were out here um uh over the last week and a half and we've been picking thistles or pulling thistles and getting them out of our our pasture out here and um because with me delivering fire trucks and just start trying to start this and and stuff some of the thistles have gotten ahead of us over the last several years and uh thistles are not a um uh uh, an annual plant they're actually a biennial so in other words they'll come back for two years they're not perennial in that they keep living and keep living but they live for two years their life cycle is a two-year life cycle so you'll have the ones from last year but you'll also have the ones from this year and you and you got double crop and, and you're blessed with all those thorns and as we were talking about it while we were picking thistles or plucking them out by the ground we're trying to get the root because if you you can really look at thistles and and what does god say in the very very beginning of the bible he says because you've disobeyed me because you chose to steal my personal property and and people say well god isn't concerned about personal property rights and and you know if god wasn't concerned about personal property rights adam and eve would still be in the garden Mm -hmm. that's right so don't try to tell me that God is a communist because he's not. He is not, he has not ever been, nor will he ever be a communist. Because the communist says all things belong to the state. God says that all things belong to the individual or not all things, but everything under that individual's control belongs to them and he has personal property. And, and when somebody has purple, personal property, don't touch it. Leave it alone. He said, you can have everything in the garden. All of it's yours. Except one thing. Leave my tree alone. Don't touch it. My tree is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Leave it alone. It's not yours. Don't touch it. You can look at it all you want. Leave it alone. It's not yours. And... And so, as we were talking, and we're, we're having one of those life lessons, we're having one of those lessons on the way, we're out there doing this grueling, awful work, 500 and some, this, I don't even know, I don't want to know, 
a lot of thistles and we're digging them out by the root and we're getting them and and the thing is that thistles are very much a picture of sin and the curse of sin and I can take my mower out there and I can mow the thistles off and it looks like I don't have any thistles in my yard oh look at me I I don't have any thistles I'm I don't have any sin in my life oh I can carry on a good show but if you actually get out into the grass and actually start looking you realize that all I did was chop off the thistles I didn't or I didn't I cut them off at the at the above the ground and I didn't actually get down and they'll be back they'll be back and they'll be multiplied and they'll be back and they'll be bigger and uglier than ever and I so because I've looked out at my yard before because that's normally what I do is just mow over them <laughs> <laughs> and strategy's not working. It's honestly. not working. And and so the thing is, is that when you when you when you are dealing with thistles, just like when you're dealing with sin, you have to get down below the crown, you have to get down to the roots, and you have to yank them out by the roots, or you will keep ending up with the same problem. I don't care if you're going below the surface of the ground just a little bit. If you're not getting down to the crown of that plant. And getting down to the roots, you're not going to get rid of the plant. And just like sin in our lives, if we're not getting down past the, the crown of that sin and the root ca- get down, getting down to the root cause of it and the root issue, we're not going to get rid of it. And so we have to rely on the Holy Ghost to help us to get rid of those crowns and get rid of those, those, the roots or we're never going to be past it. We're never going to move past it. That's right. And- uh, you know, one verse that came to my mind here uh, while, while you're talking was uh, James 1, 27, and it says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit the orphans and, and windows in their distress mm-hmm. and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And, you know, the the context of this passage, you know, James 1, 22, we all know this, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Mm-hmm. It's in context of uh, not just having a, a written doctrinal statement, but having a living doctrinal statement. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what... Teshua is all about here mm-hmm. is um, having a living doctrinal statement and, and not in the, not in the sense of like a living document but in the sense of a a person who's living mm-hmm. um, excuse me and they're they're going out and they're actually investing in these orphans mm-hmm. uh, wh- whether they're literal orphans or whether they're functional orphans because mm-hmm. their parents sold them into this mm-hmm. um, and some are actual orphans too mm-hmm. uh, that's what they're doing right that, that's that's what you guys are doing and, and it's an incredible thing to see that because um, it it's coming out and it's saying with taking these orphans and it's creating a it's restoring them so that it can stop that uh, that line of sin mm-hmm. and create a new line there a new creature that then goes forward mm-hmm. in a generational faith right and and you know this is the thing that <clears throat> um, I, I started to talk about this a little bit or go or, or a little bit before we we uh, started recording, and I told you I was going to hold on to the story because um, I've been watching occasionally watching the uh, Unashamed podcast from uh, Phil and and Jace normally, right? Yeah, Jace and, and and the Robertsons from Duck Dynasty and stuff, and and he, he, he doesn't watch it all the time though. Because he's a little jealous, his beard's not as long as theirs. Actually, I think mine is. And actually, <laughs> Willie just shaved like Willie like real. Yeah, I did see his haircut and everything. <laughs> yeah, Willie like got rid of all of it, <laughs> or almost all of it. And and uh, of course, so, he was always kind of a pretty boy anyway. So. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Phil and Miss K, um, or it came out in the media here. Uh, I don't know, over the last couple of months that, that Phil had had an affair way back, way back. Before he was saved. Before he was saved. Um, and, and he was already married to Miss K, but this is way, while he's completely a heathen reprobate at the time, uh, completely unsaved. And something that struck me that was really interesting to me, and especially in light of the conference this weekend, and I told um, uh, Pastor Bill about it, uh, was especially in regards to the generational because Pastor Bill was talking about um, uh, how when that 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 um, that line of reprobate sinner gets passed on um, generationally and 
And the thing was, is okay, so Phil had this affair before he became a Christian. But before uh, his daughter was born, he became a Christian. And he didn't just step one toe into the kingdom. He went in full tilt and started winning souls and, and started going after people and, and really trying to lead people to the Lord and stuff and and, uh, uh, and led his kids to the Lord, you know, um, and so on and so forth. And, and so here, 45 years later, he uh, Jace gets handed this note or this letter from this lady that came to their church one day right about Christmas time this last year uh, 2019 and Jace gets handed this note or this letter and then she had also sent one to the church and so Alan got it too okay and so both Jace and Alan uh, read this letter and stuff and they're like what we we may have a relative here because she had done some DNA work. She didn't know who her dad was. She had no clue. No idea. And um, her and her husband are both born again. And, and so on and so forth. And they're like, you know, what's this going to do? Should we pursue this? Should we not pursue this? Because she had DNA and done and and, um, and it was pointing to the Robertsons and, and stuff. And so... She's like, man, what do I, you know, what do we do here? So they took a lot of time and they prayed about it, and, and finally they decided, yeah, we need to, we need to at least send a letter, and, and then whatever happens from there happens. And, and so they they sent this letter. Jace reads it, Alan reads it, and they both decide, you know, we can't keep this from Dad, so we need to talk to Dad about it and, and Mom. And so they go to Miss Kay and, and Phil, and they and they talk about this, and and uh, Miss Kay goes. Yeah. She didn't have any questions. She goes, yeah, this is his child. She didn't She didn't even know. She didn't know that he had a child. And he didn't know he had a child. But as soon as she heard it, she's like, yep, this, yep, this is, yep. Mm -hmm. She knew. And uh, she, she goes, this is real. Because she had told him for years, she goes, don't be surprised if something comes back out of your past. And you find out that you have a son, or, or she always thought it was going to be a son. Mm -hmm. Well, come to find out, Phil has a daughter named Phyllis, and and um, but the thing that was really, really and interesting, Phyllis, yeah, Phyllis, and Phyllis. and but she never knew who her dad was, like I said. Mm -hmm. And the thing that really struck me to on this whole scenario or this whole story was something that she said, or something that that they all said. So Phil has this affair. Uh, a couple months later, doesn't know that that the lady he had the affair with is pregnant. Um, he gets born again, and you know moves away, and and that's kind of the end of the story. And so he gets saved, starts leading all of his kids to the Lord. Um, but she starts telling her side of, it and she says, "I'm the only one in my entire family that went to church." Nobody else in my family went to church. We weren't raised in church. I took myself to church. I caught a ride to church. I did whatever I had to do to get to church. She goes, I'm the only one that ever went to church. And as Pastor Bill was talking this weekend about generational, I'm sitting there going, this is an absolutely stellar picture of this whole thing because the father got saved, the generation. Mm -hmm. Not part of, even the one that was outside of the familial relationship ends up ends up getting saved because God looks at him and goes okay you've completely committed your heart to me you want to see all your children come to me and you're working diligently to, to get all your children to come to me I'm going to help you with this wow. one over here that you don't even know about mm -hmm. and Ooh, I, I was, shivers. it was it was awesome and so when we as fathers take that time to really dig into the word of God and really dig into what God has to say about stuff, God will turn around and say, I got your back on the rest of it. I will, I will take care of the generation. Well, and that's the, you know, the incredible thing about God, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, so, so often we, we just downplay the, the significance of simple obedience. Mm -hmm. But yet simple obedience has far greater of an impact than, mm -hmm. uh, than what, talents or mm -hmm. gifts or mm -hmm. uh, finances or any of those other things right. could, could ever bring mm -hmm. the greatest impact is simple obedience 
And then a lot of times God actually then goes and gives you, uh, you know, he will equip you for the work that he has for you then. Mm -hmm. uh, and so whatever that takes, he equips you with. But mm -hmm. it's that simple obedience just goes so much further than what we could ever imagine anything else. And, and right. you can see that picture right there with, uh, with Phil Robertson. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things that, that another thing that Pastor Bill was talking about was leadership versus followership. Mm -hmm. And and that's what you're seeing demonstrated in, in Phil Robertson is he's he became a follower of Christ, mm -hmm. and and because he was following Christ, and as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, not follow me because I'm a great leader, right? And even though Paul was a great leader, he 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 didn't say follow me because I'm a great leader. He said follow me as I follow Christ. Well, and, and in Philippians, uh, the Apostle Paul actually goes and says that basically all of his flesh, which would have been that great leadership, because, I mean, you got to remember who the Apostle Paul was. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was mm -hmm. of the tribe of Benjamin. He was uh, a, a Pharisee, according to the law, blameless. He was mm -hmm. uh, full of zeal. He had all this kind of stuff. He was probably an incredible leader. Mm -hmm. But he empties himself of that where he says he counts it as rubbish. Mm -hmm in order that he might know Christ. And so what is he saying here? He says, he says, look, even my, my great talents and abilities, mm -hmm. I set them to the side and I don't tap into their power. Mm -hmm. I tap into the power of Christ. Mm -hmm. And as I follow Christ and stand in his strength, then others follow me and I can say, follow me as I follow Christ. And he's saying, follow my followership mm -hmm. and don't follow the leader. Right. Well, follow you, the follower, I guess. Follow the follower, and you know, as you're talking about that, I'm I'm thinking back to our previous one of our previous episodes where we talk about Paul and in in Barnabas, and we always think of Barnabas as kind of being the as we talked about in that episode. We always talk about we always kind of think of Barnabas as being the the second string, kind of the Paul's right hand man, but you know, he's he's not the apostle. Paul. He's not the apostle Paul, but he was the teacher he was the master he was the leader he was in but it was because he was following christ that he's now discipling in 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 uh teaching paul and and showing paul how to follow and and even though paul had all these accolades and he had the great you know uh this that and the other thing and stuff and i thought i turned my volume down on that <laughs> that's okay um but um Anyway, so, you know, you always think of Paul as being, um, um, the main he, he, Yeah, well, he had all these accolades, and, you know, you would have thought, well, he had all these accolades. He should be the follower, or the leader, and, but that wasn't the way it was, and he learned to be a follower mm -hmm. of Christ by following Barnabas, and then he was able to teach Timothy and Titus and all these other men that came after him and teach them how to be followers of Christ by learning to to follow his followership right you know and that's one of the things that that they brought out this weekend in the conference that i thought was really really uh, important yeah and you know there's uh uh pastor scripture actually uh, that's what i preached on on sunday because it was father's day and you're talking about blessings from jonathan edwards and of course mm -hmm. uh talk about followership um genesis 48 and uh, in verses uh, 14 through 16 here, I'll just read that. Mm -hmm. And it says, uh, but Israel, and this is Jacob is what it's talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, Jacob had his name changed to Israel. And so just to keep it's right. not type of the country, it's talking about Father Israel. Right. Uh, but Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and on the left hand of Manasseh, uh, head crossing his hands, although Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me uh, from all evil, bless the lads, and many, uh, and may my name live on in them, and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Mm -hmm. And he gave a blessing that mm -hmm. reached both backwards and forwards. He goes and he roots it in the past of the following uh, or the walking before God that Abraham and Isaac did. Mm -hmm. And then he goes and he puts it forward and says, you know, let my name live live on kind of a thing. And, and he blesses them. And we go and we find, we go to Hebrews chapter 11, mm -hmm. and we could see how this plays out. It plays out in an incredible way 
where we see that uh, it talks about the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. Mm -hmm. It says that they, um, you know, they, they were great. They, they followed God. They made it in the hall of faith there, the chapter of faith. And they were looking for a, a city whose builder and maker is God. Mm -hmm. And if they would have thought back to that, they could have returned, but they didn't. They pressed on towards that and they laid hold of the promise. And it was a generational faith that was passed on from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But we see that's what Jacob here, or Israel, is what, it, what he's called now, because his name's mm -hmm. been changed. He's he's wrestled uh, with, with God, and, mm -hmm. and so and that's what's talked about there, the angel that he received or was forgiven of, of his evil from. It's actually God um, coming down in angel form. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and, and it's it's a faith then that's passed down. It's it's a blessing that goes backwards and mm -hmm. forwards, and that's what a generational faith is. And that's that's what Pastor Bill I think was talking about mm -hmm. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the things that that is so important in in, in <sighs> is getting the children when they're young. You mm -hmm. know, because one of the things that he talked about um, over time over this weekend too was. Uh, the zero to 12, 12 or thirteen, the the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, always um, celebrate their uh, bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs at the age of twelve and thirteen. Um, and I don't remember which way. If the girls are twelve and the boys are thirteen, I don't I remember. I believe that's what it is. I yeah. think it is. Um, but that's the age. That time period is the age at which they decide to do right or wrong for themselves. It's a personal. Uh, it's a personal. Um, uh, responsibility kind of getting yeah bad. and I'm trying to remember the word that he used um, but then uh, it's a personal followership and in their their um, they're learning to follow the Holy Spirit and they're learning to uh, make Jesus the Lord of their lives and they're learning the difference between right and wrong at that age period but they their brains have not developed to the point that they are able to understand the external evil mm -hmm. that's around them and to decide between the right and wrong of, or the, the, the good, good and evil. evil externally and and so really that age from about 12 or 13 to, to 19 uh, 20 and it's interesting because I went to a, a conference years ago for a, for a company that I was working with and the uh, the president or CEO of the company that I was working with at the time he said you know he goes um, I don't think that children really should be allowed to make decisions in their t until they're 20 years old. He goes, because really, I don't think their brains have developed. I think that we should, we should go back and we should, once they hit 20, they should start over at year zero. And, and you're like, kind of a jerk thing to say, you know. <laughs> As a 24-year-old, you're, you're like, oh, you know. But... Now, as 48 years old, I understand what he was coming from. And it, it's not to be insulting to him, but it's that, that 0 to 19 age is where, or the, the 12 or 13, rather, to 19-year-old age is where they're starting to learn how to protect themselves against good and evil mm -hmm. externally. And, and this really comes back to, uh, you know, people may say, well, how do you tie that into Teshua? Well, it's very simple because... Um, something I'm actually working on putting together right now is an offer where we're going to have um, a um, we're going to do a little booklet that'll talk about the signs of trafficking. It'll talk about uh, things to look for with your kids being groomed by traffickers. Um, it'll talk about ways of protecting your children while they're online and stuff. Uh, Pastor Kerry shared a story about one of his sons this weekend and. and his son was just innocently playing a, a video game that oh, I think it was on his Xbox or something. I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, um, and all of a sudden, uh, an outside player from somewhere uh, had designed their own avatar for the for the game, which they can do, and they can create their own avatars or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and his avatar was of a of a woman naked from the from the waist up. And, and Pastor Kerry's son was just like, came to him in tears and, Dad, I don't, I, what the heck? I don't, I don't want to see this. And, and, and Pastor Kerry had to make the decision as a father to help protect his child from the external 
the the external forces of good and evil and to help them navigate through that and said okay you're not ready yet to to um see the difference between good and evil externally you know it internally but you you haven't made that connection yet to the external and and so i'm you're not going to play xbox anymore Mm -hmm. for now and and he talked about it in regards to having smartphones and stuff and and um you know i i really feel the pastor carries right i feel like a lot of the pastors are saying don't give your kids smartphones they're absolutely correct and i know that that's going to go over like a lead well well you know uh, balloon I, so, so i'm a little younger okay mm -hmm. you know i'm i uh I, I and when i first heard that you know i was going ooh, really Mm -hmm. But then I started thinking about it, and as I thought about it, I went, this is kind of the, the question that the Holy Spirit brought up, brought up in my mind was, name one time, just once, where it was a good idea mm -hmm. for somebody under the age of 19, or under the age of 20, mm -hmm. um, to have a smartphone. Which then, of course, I, I did realize that I didn't have a smartphone until I was 20. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe 21. Actually, I think it was 21. Um, but I can't name a single time mm -hmm. where it's actually worked out for the better. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen uh, every single time. You, and, and think, I'm just challenging you here. Because mm -hmm. at first, like you said there, it kind of goes over like a, a lead balloon because it's so counterculture. Mm -hmm. But just just think about it and write it down write mm -hmm. this down and I, and if you come up with an answer just tell me mm -hmm. but name one time where it was actually a good thing something good came out mm -hmm. of a 20 or, or somebody who's under 20 to have a smartphone and what i mean by this is every single time i've seen it with a kid having a smartphone mm -hmm. it's always the parent ends up saying well, they're doing this behind my back. They're doing that behind my back. They mm -hmm. got into this. They got into that. And no, it might not be the worst thing ever. It might just be, oh, they were instant messaging that boy. Right. Or, oh, they were doing this or that. And it might have been, in one sense, fairly innocent, but it was still sneaking behind the parents' mm -hmm. back. And it was trying to hide it from the parents. Mm -hmm. And it was trying to keep it from the parents. And it was trying to do that. And most of the time, it ends up being something that's bad. But it ends up almost always creating, a, from every time I can think of it, creates at least some friction between the parent and the child. And, and let's just dispel something here. It's actually not God's design to have teenagers and parents do this. Right. It's actually not God's design. Mm -hmm. But it's that they would work together mm -hmm. in, the, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it can work like that, Christian, if you obey God's word, right? You know, and that doesn't mean everything's always going to be smooth and, and, right. and perfect, right? But you're, it shouldn't be a relationship of we're constantly like this. You should be your parent, your, your child, and parent should be. And I'm careful when I say this here. You should have a good friendship, although it should be a parentship in a childship. Right. Like it's not saying just be. It shouldn't be equal. It shouldn't be equal, right? No. There's a lot of people who parent that way, and that's the wrong way to parent. But mm -hmm. I'm probably getting way too into the weeds here. Well, so. no, because you know, doing what I do, and and having to do the research that I do, and all this stuff, I, the internet is so dangerous. People don't even understand. This is why my 17-year-old doesn't have a... He has a flip phone. You know what? He can text. He can text his parents. He hardly ever even answers a dumb phone. <laughs> In fact, before we started recording, I had my wife call me and said, Hey, I'm trying to get all the Harrison. Can you go get him? <laughs> He's not answering his phone. He didn't even know where it was at. But, but groomers, child sex predators love... Hear me, Christian parent. Child sex predators love smartphones. Mm -hmm. I am giving you a very stern warning. Child sex predators love smartphones. Why? Because they're easy to conceal. The conversations are easy to conceal. It's easy to keep it behind your back. And you don't have to know anything about it. And they can ask for for uh, for sex. They can ask for. Um, um, well, and you might not. You, you might think that you would run into those, 
but with things like Snapchat, which, by the way, is, is, is a huge social media platform now. Mm-hmm. And the whole purpose of Snapchat was actually, in its design, mm-hmm. was to sext. I mean, that was the idea. It's, it's there for a little time, and then it's gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, the, the, you know, the reality of it is is that your child could be doing these things, and you not have any idea or any clue Mm-hmm. You could go and look through their phone every night, but the thing deletes every... It doesn't stay on their phone. Right. I mean, that's the thing. Right. And there's there's a multitude of apps that are out there that can be downloaded for... <clears throat> Psyching out the parents? Is that where you're getting at? The ones that are the fake apps that so the parents can't don't know what's going on? Right. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, okay, some of these apps have a... a, a um, what could be used as a Christian could be used as a very good purpose. Right. For example, I could I could run into a, a communist country, and I could smuggle in Bibles by by putting them inside this app that nobody else would know that this app isn't really what it says it is. What it says it is. It, it'll look. It'll act. It'll do everything that it says it does. But there may be one secret back door on it, and it's in and in that inside that app. There's a vault that you can put pictures, this, that, and the other thing, and you would never know it was there. And and so there's so many nefarious things out there. I mean, yes, we could use that as a as a Christian missionary. We can use that to smuggle Bibles in because we can download the entire Bible into the language that we're going into, put it inside this vault, cover it over with the app, and, and boom, we're done. We're in. Mm-hmm. And and they could the the communists could go through our our phone and and look and never see what we're actually taking in, but as much good as it can do, it can do a lot more evil. Yeah, well, because we're talking about tools, and mm-hmm. unfortunately, Satan is generally better at using tools than what we are. Mm-hmm. Um, now we have the advantage of the the Holy Spirit, so we can overcome. Mm-hmm. But. Satan's, uh, you know, a greater theologian than I am, and yet he's a devil still. You know, mm-hmm. I, I believe that's uh, A.W. Tozer said that, and it, it's true. That's it, Satan generally has us out thought. Mm-hmm. Well, he's had how many umpteen thousand years to practice? Right. I mean, he knows the scripture. He understands the scripture. And and that's the thing is, you know. He understands the technology, and and he knows the the. We're outclassed, we're outmatched, and and everything else. But that means that we have to do our due diligence, and mm-hmm. we have to do our our work, and and sometimes the best way to outmaneuver and outclass somebody is to just not give them, you know, not give the enemy the 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 tool that he needs to get your kids ensnared, you know. It can be the dumbest things. I'm just going to share an example from our own lives. So, um, my wife and I had this this picture. It was a um, a Gustav Klimt picture. She was an art student, you know, musician, whatnot, when she was in college and stuff. And so she had all this different artwork, and and it was called the Kiss. It was nothing nothing risque about the picture. It was a very modest picture. It was. It was, you know, there was no clothes revealing. There was no, you know, it was it was a very modest picture. But um, I had decided I was going to get rid of it and not have it in the house anymore. I just, I just didn't didn't set well with me, and and so we had decided we were going to try to sell it on eBay or whatever. And and so my oldest son and I went, and we were he's like 13 years old or so, and we we start going through eBay. 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 Trying to figure out how to, you know, should we sell this picture? What's it going to bring? So we started going on to the art section of, of eBay. Shouldn't be anything nefarious. Well, you wouldn't think. Though, right? He saw pictures and, and you know, it it still did something. And and he had to deal with that for, for several years. And, and, you know, so... You have to understand that there is a very dangerous, and I'm not trying to be a doomsayer or whatever, but or a killjoy, but you have to understand that there are some very dangerous places 
well, on the internet that look very, very good. You know, a lot of times, I, I've had this accusation put against me a few times. I'm, I'm a stick in the mud. You ever mm -hmm. heard that? You know, and you know, the, people use that generally as a, uh, um, a an insult. You know, yeah. yeah. Here's the thing, though. What are they trying to say with a stick in the mud? It's that it's stuck. Yeah, I'm going to hold my ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be a stick in the mud all day. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's if you're not a stick in the mud, you know what you are? You're a floating log, and any dead thing can flow with the uh, uh, can go with the flow. But it takes something living to swim against it. That's mm -hmm. the reality of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, you know, just just before we, we did this, in fact, you, you don't even know this because uh, I think you were you were grabbing the the, the tea for for the oh, episode. Huh. I, I just went went in uh, and. Your your kids are watching uh, watching a TV show and it's just ending and a new one was starting and it was was it a kid show on there and I uh, it, and it came up and, and all of a sudden one of them the older one got up and, and changed the channel on it mm -hmm. and I go oh you you don't watch that one no there's a there's a transgender uh, mm -hmm. that's on there and I I didn't even know about uh, you know about that but well we don't do a whole lot of TV that's right. that's kind of kind of a secret there but I know you guys don't do a whole lot either but um, but it's one of those things where I was really impressed because it's that idea of there's not even a, a wonder, there's not even a thought about it. Is this is the rule and it's there for mm -hmm. protection to go and to do that. And there was somebody who uh, told me in a Sunday school class one time they, they were teaching it and they said I was asked the question or I was, it was this accusation came against me this week and they said uh, you're brainwashing your children and the guy's response was good and the person was just shocked. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, if I'm not brainwashing them, who is? Mm -hmm. And that's what it takes to have generational faith. And I know some people are going to go and say, well, Pastor Sam said, brainwash your children. That's fine. Renew their minds. That's really what I mean by that. What does it say? Wash your, wash your mind with the washing of the water of the word. Right. And that we need to understand this as Christians. These, mm -hmm. are, these are things that, you know, and the generational faith. This, I don't know if this is quite initially what we're intending, but. We always find the path that God wants us to go on right. in this podcast. So. Right. But we are uh, just probably near in a time where we need to uh, need I to can't, close I can't it up. The times. So. <laughs> so I think we're getting close to an hour. We're, we're getting close, but I want to I want to I want to go down this road a little bit because well. I think it's really important because you know one of the things and you don't have yours on, but we got these bracelets this weekend. I, I really like them, but I've got. In between, girly wrist and man wrist, apparently, because <laughs> neither one of the sizes were right there. So, so. Um, but anyway, so they gave us these bracelets this weekend. And it says family on it, and and Rick Santorum, I think, is the one that that he had been given a bracelet by somebody. And the word family uh, is can be an acronym, and in this case, it was an acronym, and it says "Forget about me, I love you," and that's the thing, you know. Am I saying taking away your kid's smartphone is going to be easy? <laughs> I tell you, it's going to be hard. <laughs> you, you might have World War III on your hands, and you might have an upside child. Um, <laughs> you I will have an upside child. Yeah, I, you I will have an upside child on your hands. But but for those those parents that are coming up, and, and you may be looking at that critical time period where you're going, okay, do I get my kid a smartphone or do I not? And and I would I would... Caution you, don't. Um, you know, this brings up a story about a, a car dealership that I used to work for. And I had these parents come in one day and they were looking for a car for their daughter. They And this was clear back in the early 2000s. Uh, I think it was actually 2000. Um, and they had they they were commenting to me. They said, we made a, a dumb, dumb mistake. And I said, okay, what would you do? So they bought a Chevy. No, I'm just no. kidding. I'm just kidding. They, they, they had gone out. <laughs> she had just turned 16 and, 16, and they went out and bought her a brand new Mitsubishi Eclipse, the little sports car. But a brand new one. Brand new one. And it wasn't six months, and she totaled it. And they're like, we're not buying you another one. Just saying, we're not. We're, you're going to have an old beater. And, and if you wreck it, too bad. So, you know. And... And Dad confided in me. He said to me, he goes, that was the dumbest thing I could have ever done. He goes, because now nothing else is good enough. And 
the thing that you have to do, and 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 I really want to, I want to hit this uh, and drive the point home, is you need to take these actions. I I understand. I I have to deal with this stuff on a daily basis. I have to see where stuff's coming in. I have to know where where are the holes, where are the the gates, so to speak, that, that Satan is going to try to make an inroad in, especially in my family because of what I do. I mean, when you're trying to deliver girls from the sex trade, Satan is going to come after and he's going to try to, to um, he's going to try to blindside you somewhere. And he's going to try to get in there and, in, in, uh, you know, how many, you know, so I have to be diligent. Satan's thinking generationally. Mm -hmm. if, if he can't, if, if he couldn't stop you from getting saved, or if he couldn't stop you from being an effective Christian uh, in, in the immediate, he's going to try to stop you from being an effective Christian in the next generation. Mm -hmm. He's going to try to try to uh, choke out the seeds that you've planted. Mm -hmm. And and you have to have that relationship with your children. You have to tie those strings of fellowship. And and as you tie those strings of fellowship, then when you come to them and you say, hey. Okay, here's the deal. I made a mistake. And be willing to say that. You know what? I've had a lot of times I've had to come to my kids and say, you know what? I blew it. I screwed up. I did something wrong. I, I made a poor decision on, on letting you have this or letting you do this or, you know, getting lax on this area or that area. And, and so we need to shore up and we need to correct some things and, and there's nothing wrong with that in fact really what it does is it leads by example and it, it shows your kids that you're vulnerable enough to say hey I screwed up I made a mess of this I made a mistake you know I need to say I'm sorry and then what it does is it shows them that they can turn around and say they're sorry and they can they can follow your example as you're following Christ and, and Christ said repent and be baptized and, and so if I'm following him when I screw up, I'm going to repent. I'm going to say I'm sorry. And, and so then it, my kids can follow that. But as you tie those strings of fellowship, then when you come back to them, you say, you know what? I love you enough that I, I have found a hole here that is introducing or could introduce some very bad things into your life. And I love you enough that I want to blockade that hole. Is this going to hurt? Yeah. Is this going to stink? Yeah, I understand that. But I love you enough. And I care enough about you that, you know what, I don't want to see you get hurt. I don't want to see you get trafficked. I don't want to see somebody come along and, and somehow injure, injure you. And and so, you know, we need to shore this up. And, and so I need to have the smartphone handed over. And what? there may be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> um, it, and, and here's the big thing. It's... Looking forward past your own two feet. If you want to be a generational Christian, mm -hmm. one that reaches generation to generation, a Jonathan Edwards, mm -hmm. you have to look past your own two feet. Is it going to be painful in the immediate future? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. But is it going to be more painful in a decade, decade from now mm -hmm. if you give in and you avoid the pain now? Mm -hmm. See. So when you put off the pain, mm -hmm. it hurts more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you, you know, I a uh, number of years ago, about almost almost ten years ago, maybe it was nine years ago, I I broke my hand uh, playing basketball. I didn't punch a wall or anything like that. Just kind of a freak thing. Somebody ran in my hand and it snapped. I thought I dislocated my finger. I looked down and I didn't realize it was my hand and it wasn't all bad. I ended up getting my wife's phone number out of it, you know, because she said she'd pray for me. I said, well, I better have your phone number so I can text you to let you know how the surgery goes. Because, mm. uh... That's a good backup line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, just <laughs> make the most of every opportunity. Um, Carpe diem. Seize the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I broke my hand and the dumb thing was I played three games of basketball and it broke. I knew it was broke. When I got done, uh, me and some friends, we went to Village Inn to go get some pie. And I, I stopped in, and the, the place was saying, I go, hey, you guys got any uh, ibuprofen? And they go, oh, yeah, sure, why? I said, ah, I broke my hand. I figured I should probably get ahead of the pain. 
And they started laughing. I said, no, I'm serious. I, I broke my hand. Oh, no, I didn't take you to the hospital. Oh, no, it's just a broken hand. Who cares? Well, I waited a week. I, I mean, I typed a 10-page paper on it. I did all this kind of stuff. I probably could have got off with just a cast. Instead, I got a plate and five screws. If I'd have taken care of it right away, yep. it wouldn't have gotten as bad. It, Mm -hmm. My wife can't listen to this podcast because she often, you know, points it out whenever I get injured. <laughs> hey, remember your hand. I said, yeah, I got you out of the deal. It wasn't too bad. But, uh, um, but in all seriousness, take care of the problem mm -hmm. early and it won't hurt as much later. Because mm -hmm. I, I had so much more pain. I remember sitting there thinking, my goodness, my hand hurts a whole lot more after the surgery mm -hmm. than it did when I broke it. Because, you know, they had to cut through. I mean, I got a big old scar, you know, about... I don't know, two, three inches on my hand right mm -hmm. there. And uh, they had to cut through all that and get there and put that in there. And I mean, I've got permanent stuff where, you know, I can't, the, the tendons are tied down. And it's just, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. But it's because I didn't take care of it right away. Mm -hmm. It might hurt to take care of it right away. You right. have to, oh man, I got a busy schedule. I'd rather go, you know, show my toughness and play games of basketball on it, bro. Mm -hmm. That was stupid. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be better in the long run. And that's the same with your children. <clears throat> Take care of it now. You know, and, and as you're telling that story, I'm thinking to a, one of my best friends, and, and uh, he's, he'll openly talk about the story, so I don't think he'll mind me sharing it. And if he does, oh, well, I'm bigger and older than he is. <laughs> so, um, but he, uh, he talks about, um, and he and I have had multiple conversations because they have three boys, and, and I don't tell the story to bash on him because he knows the mistake that they made and stuff but when the boys were younger they had him in christian school and 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 stuff and and both he and his wife were both working and they weren't homeschooling and and um they didn't want to step out in that in that that realm of trusting the holy spirit and trusting god to be their provider um in some areas and in and or working to find a solution where they could homeschool and and really be active and involved in their kids and stuff, and and I'm not saying that everybody put, that puts their kids in in public school is is unattentive. I'm not saying that or public Christian school or whatever. I'm not saying that. I'm not. The decision I, that they were making was based on convenience. It wasn't based on obedience. Right, and and so the thing that they were dealing with though, or you know, it was something happened in sixth grade. Um, there was there was a situation at school where where the the one son got in trouble for eating cookies when he wasn't supposed to and and he never it never got really properly dealt with and he never understood why he was wrong why why did they dare tell me no to to and I would say that that goes back even further to another issue but but we'll just start at that segment and so it never really got dealt with. And so, because it never really got dealt with, that rebellion was allowed to lay dormant, and and he was quietly rebellious. It wasn't outwardly, it wasn't, it was just a quiet, dormant rebellion that was going on and brewing and seething and stuff that very well could have had a better opportunity of being caught and expelled had it been, had they been really active and involved and stuff. But out of convenience, they they chose not to, and so now they're looking at at the the situation where he's he's getting ready to graduate, and and they're going or he is graduating, and um, and they're going well. You know, we've we've done the best we could, but now he's going to have to go through the school of hard knocks because now he's he doesn't he knows there's a guy, but he doesn't see why he needs him, mm. and and so he hasn't. He hasn't had that come to Jesus meeting where he understands the the need for salvation and the need for Christ and the need for that stuff. And so now they're they're sitting back going, well, uh, you know, we need to ch we need to make some changes here. And and so they are making the changes with their two younger ones. But it would have been better for all involved if they made the changes earlier. Mm -hmm. But because they, they just thought, well, everything's honky-dory. I don't need to, you know, make any changes here. You know, we're, life's good. You know, what the heck? And they didn't catch things that they should have or could have caught in, in, 
and dealt with sooner and earlier and and so then they you know now they're paying the price for it right you know so um anyway we'll kind of wrap up there i kind of feel like we're kind of at a closing spot here so thank you very much for joining us on the Tishua unveiled now liberty unveiled podcast um please leave comments if you don't like something we say leave a comment let us address it or if you do like something we say let us know uh the comments really do help uh google and all the other platforms really look at that and, and it helps us uh get the word out there um like and subscribe and share and please tell your friends to join us it really does mean a lot to us and it really does help so um anyway i appreciate your time and i appreciate you joining us thank you and have a great day bye-bye you've been listening to the liberty unveiled podcast setting captives free one episode at a time Liberty Unveiled Podcast is a part of the Unresolved Podcast Network and has been brought to you by Teshua Tea Company, T-E-S-H-U-A-H-T-E-A dot com or DeliveranceTea.com.